Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Philip. I'm here with Georg, who's sitting right here and who will cover the second part. And I think we, can, we could dive right in. Uh, before I start, I'm curious, uh, who here has used Tor at some point in their lives? Okay, that's a lot of hands. Who uses it every single day? That's a lot less hands. Uh, who here is running a relay? Okay, pretty much the same hands. Yeah, I hope it's going to be more towards the end of the night. Uh, I'll give you a very quick overview about how it works, and uh, the rest of the next 30 minutes I'm going to be talking about bad relays, because you might have read some media articles which portray the entire thing in a somewhat bad light, and I will show what's really behind this. So, uh, yeah, this is how Tor basically works. So it's basically an anonymity network which consists as of now of approximately 7,000 relays distributed all over the world. And we have typically three of them. So if you route your traffic over Tor, if you use the Tor browser, it automatically selects three of those relays somewhere in the world. And the first one is the entry guard, which is basically the entrance into your network all the time. Then you have a middle relay and you have an exit relay. And the funny thing about Tor is uh, it some way encrypts your traffic and it also doesn't, which is really difficult to explain to people who don't have a technology background, right? <laughs> because if you talk to networking people, it's easy to understand. It encrypts up to some point, and from then on, it doesn't anymore. But if you try to explain the same thing to people who are not in computer science, it becomes a little bit messy, right? Because you tell them, yeah, it does encrypt your traffic, but then again, it doesn't. So which one is it, right? And then you have to go into network topology, and at this point you lose most people. And uh, yeah, so it does encrypt it, but it also doesn't. Uh, that's the important thing to keep in mind. So your destination website doesn't know where you, you're coming from, uh, but the exit relay is able to read your traffic, and it's also able to manipulate your traffic. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. Even though the exit relay doesn't know uh, who it is messing with, it can mess with your traffic in some ways. And as I already said, yeah, we do have exit relays, and those are only a small part of the total amount of relays we have. So we have approximately 7,000 as of now, so uh, it shows continuous growth over the years, it gets more and more, and only 1,000 of them are exit relays. And they don't show a lot of growth, they remain more or less static over the years. And all of them are run by volunteers. So uh, the Tor project typically says that we don't run the network. We only give you basically the Tor browser and uh, the rest of the network is run by volunteers, right? And yeah, that is good and bad, mostly good. But the bad thing is that not all of these volunteers are honest, as I will show. And another thing is it's really easy to set up a relay. It's not a, it's not a huge chunk of work. You can actually do it in approximately 10 minutes if you have a little bit of computer background. It's really not a hard thing to do, which is one of uh, the reasons why I would really encourage you to just consider setting one up, right? It doesn't take a lot of time and it doesn't need a lot of work uh, once it's running. And yeah, it's run by volunteers, and you might wonder, why are they doing this? Why are they just sacrificing their bandwidth, their computers, to run a relay for the Tor network? And I think there are lots of reasons for this. Uh, one reason is simply altruism, right? Uh, we all want to have good things, and we want other people to have good things, too. Uh, some people do it for research, uh, to learn more about how the network works, or more about anonymity networks in general. Uh, some organizations want to get some PR benefit out of it. I think it was Akamai recently who started running a bunch of Tor relays. <coughs> and some people maybe just out of curiosity, right? And uh, here is a link in there, uh, which I could quickly show you, which gives you a quick overview uh, about what Tor can do and cannot do for you. So it's a really cool visualization. And this is basically the path from you to a site on the internet without Tor, without HTTPS. And for every party on the way, you see what it can read. I see that the font is a little bit small, but in that case, uh, almost all parties can see almost everything, right? They know where you're coming from, where you're going to, what you're doing, they can tamper with their traffic. And once you use Tor, once you click on that button, uh, they lose a lot of insight, right? All of a sudden, some things they cannot see anymore. But at the same time, we have three new guys on the path who can learn something about you. 
And if you end up using HTTPS2, it gets even less, right? For example, these NSA guys, uh, which are in front of and after the Tor relay, lose the ability to see some things. So I think that this is a really useful visualization of what it can do for you. All right, so, so much about relays, but uh, this talk is mostly about the bad relays, right? Most of them are genuinely good and don't do anything to your traffic. They basically do what they promise to do. But we have a small fraction of relays uh, which are up to no good. And uh, first of all, a good relay, we consider like a good ISP, basically. It should be neutral to what it relays, right? It doesn't care about what is being sent over the network, what is going through. Uh, it treats the bytes completely agnostic. And this is the same what we want from an ISP, right? They, should, they shouldn't look at the traffic and treat it differently based on what it is. So this is what the big uh, discussion about network neutrality was all about, right? ISPs are really neutral. <coughs> they, they shouldn't care about our traffic. And the same should be true uh, for tour relays. And uh, for most of them, this is the case. But for a false action, for a uh, small fraction, it isn't. Uh, some of them are, for example, misconfigured. Uh, uh, a lot of them are Windows computers who run antivirus scanners and if you happen to route your traffic over one of these relays, you get those annoying warnings for some websites and you don't know what's going on. Uh, some of them use OpenDNS with a bad configuration, which means that some website categories are blocked. So if you're using Tor, all of a sudden you're not able to go to some websites. And ironically, one of those website categories is the <coughs> proxy slash anonymizer category. So if you happen to use Tor, maybe you're not able to go to torproject.org because the exit relay operator happens to use a bad uh, open DS, DNS configuration. So we're basically hunting those. I mean, hunting is a bad word, but we're trying to find those systematically and then drop an email to the operator and say, maybe you shouldn't do this, right? Uh, another issue is uh, the file descriptor limit because Tor has, if you run a Tor relay, you will have a lot of uh, TCP connections open simultaneously. And this is usually not what normal Linux tools like, so you have to raise the file descriptor limits before you start a relay. This is another source of errors. But this is all just misconfiguration, right? I mean, you just drop an email to somebody and they're able to fix it uh, reasonably quickly. Uh, another issue is man-in-the-middle attacks. So this is actual malice. Uh, these are people who really try to, they have bad intent, right? Or they sniff with traffic, right? It can be active or maybe it's just passive, but uh, that's the actual interesting stuff, which doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen to some degree and we're trying to, to fix those cases, basically. And you might wonder, how do we find all these relays? And uh, the, one of the easy answers is we don't. We just let you find them, right? So we have a lot of users. We have yeah, several million users who use Tor on a daily basis. And some of them stumble <coughs> across bad relays every now and then. And we encourage everybody to just drop us an email if you find one of those relays. And we have a dedicated mailing list for that. We get a lot of paranoia every now and then from people who think that they're being targeted by all different countries, uh, which doesn't turn out to be true uh, all the time. But we sometimes also get really high quality reports of people who found stuff we didn't find and then we're, we're able to fix it. So just keep that email address in mind or at least remember that we do have a mailing list for that if you ever stumble across <coughs> something and if you would like to let us know. <coughs> Uh, we also scan for bad relays by ourselves. So we have a tool which is called ExitMap. And it's basically a Python script uh, which is able to do a networking task over every single relay. So you could imagine a simple networking test which fetches uh, a domain name or which tries to resolve a domain name <coughs> over every single one of the 1000 relays. And then it compares it to what it should have gotten. And this is what we do for a lot of in order to find a lot of attacks. We do it to find DNS poisoning. Uh, we try to find SSL stripping, which works surprisingly easy once you know what to look for. Uh, the same for all sorts of man in the middle attacks against XMPP, HTTPS, IMAPS, uh, and so on, HTML injection, and a bunch of other things. And we're always looking for more ideas what to look for, right? So it's basically a bunch <laughs> of modules where we wrote down what we tried to detect. And if you have some ideas or some, some other suggestions what we should scan in addition, we would always be eager to hear that. 
And once we find those exits, we want to get rid of them, right? And uh, this is something which causes some misunderstandings sometimes because people think, oh my God, do you really have the ability to censor the network? Can you just take down the relay I'm contributing to the network? And the answer to that is to some degree. So we are trying to basically, as in many other aspects of Tor, to distribute the trust. Uh, what we have in order to get rid of bad relays is the so-called bad exit flag. So it's basically a flag which is assigned to a relay and once this is you know, propagated throughout the network, clients see that and they will say, oh, this one is a bad exit, I'm not going to use it in my circuit anymore. So it's basically you could see it as a warning to clients to no longer use a given exit relay in the circuit. And the way it works is we have nine directory authorities. Those are basically computers distributed all over the world which produce what is called the network consensus. It's a text document which comes out every hour since uh, many, many years, and it contains the list of all the relays we have. And for every relay, you see a bunch of flags, like you see here. Uh, so this relay has the fingerprint A520FF6C, and the columns you see are our nine directory authorities and every authority basically votes on what it thinks the relay should have and mostly they agree usually and it's sometimes they don't disagree <coughs> because they're in different states right and uh, what it means for us is we have three directory authorities which vote on the bad exit flag and as long as the majority of them agrees that a given relay should have this flag then it's going to have this flag and the bad exit flag you can see at the top here. So our three relays, Tor26, Moria, and Gablemu agreed on that, and what you can see in the final consensus is it has the bad exit flag, right? Mm -hmm. And at the bottom you can see that only one directory authority seems to think that uh, this particular relay is stable. The others don't think this is the case, and as a result it doesn't have the stable flag. So this is what we are doing. We are trying to distribute the trust, right? Uh, nobody in the Tor project has uh, a single call to make to say that this relay is going to be bad exited. It's basically a bunch of people who are involved in that decision. And sometimes we disagree, right? Sometimes some people think this should happen, others think other things should happen. And this is a good thing, right? It's, it's costly, it takes time and sometimes energy, but uh, at least there is not a single you know, person who can mess up badly. <coughs> And you might be wondering, uh, what are the types of attackers we are facing? And I think you can uh, classify them in two different types. What we often have is opportunistic attackers. We have people who are motivated by curiosity. They just hear in the news that it's possible to, to mess with Tor traffic in some way. And they just set up a relay, which, like I said, can take approximately 15 minutes. And then they see what's going on. And uh, some of them just sniff traffic, so there are a bunch of tricks how you can find that out. Uh, some of them manipulate traffic in some way, and uh, they all have in common that they don't seem particularly motivated to really mess with people, right? They just want to see what is possible, what is it really all about to sniff tour traffic, what are people even sending there, right? Because that is uh, an interesting question to look at, what is the Tor network used for? Because we don't have a very good understanding of that, uh, because we cannot keep statistics of that easily, right? Because if you're the only person who goes to one particular website, then you can be easily identified. Uh, if you're one out of the thousands of people who all go to facebook.com, then it's a little bit harder to do that. But the Tor project doesn't keep statistics of that, so it's a, a difficult thing to actually answer. And there have been some re research projects in the past where people tried to answer that question, but it's mostly considered unethical in the research community. So it's being frowned upon that you just set up a relay, sniff the traffic, and then come up with statistics. You know, like 20% 20, 20 of users use Facebook, and the rest do this and that. Uh, so that's not a very nice thing to do. So we don't fully understand <coughs> what the Tor network is being used for. So this is maybe one of the things attackers have an interest in. But they usually don't remain in the network for long, maybe for a couple of hours. They just start and see what's going on and then they remove the relay again. So this is usually something I wouldn't be very worried about. We catch them quickly, we remove them quickly and even if they might steal some credentials. I'm not even sure if they would be abused. 
but sometimes you also see targeted attacks, which is a little bit more worrying. And those might be motivated by financial gain, right? So a lot of websites like Bitcoin related stuff has a lot of money involved. And if you manage to steal username and password of somebody who has a lot of Bitcoins or who does some other things on the internet, then you might actually be able to make some money. And since exit relays are run by volunteers, it's pretty easy to set one up, right? And uh, I have some anecdotes about targeted attacks we found and we keep finding. Uh, and they tend to make an active effort to stay under their radar. They don't want to be found, right? Uh, which makes sense. And it's more challenging to find them. But uh, yeah, we're still making an effort to do that. And another fun thing is once you find uh, traffic tampering uh, of some sort, we don't always know who is actually doing that, right? Is it the exit relay or is it maybe the ISP of the exit relay or is it somebody further up the upstream? So this is a surprisingly difficult question to answer. So what we usually do is we just remove the relay out of the network, but maybe it wasn't the exit relay operator, right? Maybe it was the ISP who did something nasty. And we don't fully know. Uh, sometimes it's obvious, uh, but sometimes it's not. And I have another story which uh, I can talk about in a second. So yeah, this is something which makes the entire process a little bit more challenging. And so we published a, a research paper about the entire idea of bad exit relays about a year ago. And one big lesson for me personally was that uh, if you publish something like that, you have to make sure that the results are easily digestible, right? Uh, so people sometimes draw the wrong conclusions of what you publish. So what we basically did was we came up with a, with a table of approximately 40, 50 relays which were involved in malicious activity of some sort. And this happened over approximately one year. So it was about 50 relays in about one year. And people jumped to the what seemed like the straightforward conclusion. You just take the amount of bad relays, approximately 50, divide them by approximately 1,000, which is the amount of relays, and it gives you a maliciousness score, right? And then they run around and say, this is how bad the Tor network is. And it turns out it's not that easy, right? Uh, and there are basically three things why this is the case. Uh, first of all, relays aren't being treated the same, right? So we have some relays which are very, very fast, really beefy machines in data centers, and some of them are really slow, maybe a, a laptop standing somewhere at home. And uh, those aren't treated the same. The fast ones attract more traffic than the slow ones. So this is a, a very easy mechanism to do some load balancing in the Tor network, right? We actually want to make use of those resources. Uh, if they're able to contribute megabytes of data, why would we waste that? So we're basically sending more users to the fast relays. And the ones which attack do not tend to be the fastest ones, right? Which means that they get less users. Uh, so this is another thing you would have to consider in that equation. And it makes things much more difficult. Another thing is the, the Tor network isn't static. It's not a, a static set of computers, which doesn't change over time. It actually sees a lot of change. We have approximately 7,000 relays at any given point in time, but they don't stay the same, right? Every hour, a fraction disappears and more relays appear. So it's a set of 7,000, which sees a lot of change in between, right? So in distributed systems, we usually call this the churn rate. And it's actually surprisingly high for something like Tor. So we have a lot of relays which are online for only one single hour, right? They come online for an hour and then they disappear and nobody ever sees them again. And they are still counted in the network. So yeah, there is quite a lot of churn in the Tor network. And finally, one point uh, Georg is going to be talking about more is uh, all these attacks we were seeing uh, are not extremely successful, right? And they're even less successful if you're using a Tor browser, which is what you should be doing anyway. So these attacks might already fail with a standard vanilla Firefox, but if you happen to use the Tor browser, they're even less successful because uh, we're basically making use of a bunch of useful extensions and patches to further minimize the attack surface. All right, uh, after a small overview of how all this works, I wanna give you basically three anecdotes, three small war stories, if you wanna call it, 
uh, about yeah, things we, we struggled with over the last couple of years. And the first one is the relay that did HTTPS man in the middle for Bitcoin sites. So we did our you know, regular scans of the Tor network and we found one relay which seemed to target Bitcoin sites, right? Nothing else, only Bitcoin sites. Connections to Facebook remained untampered. And the funny thing was, usually when you see bad relays, they don't have contact information. Uh, you cannot contact anyone. But for some weird reason, this particular relay had contact information. And yeah, what we usually do is we just contact the operators, right? Sometimes it's just misconfiguration and you can settle things. So we just dropped this personal email. And we got a response saying that, I don't know what's going on. I mean, there is this HTTPS man in the middle against Bitcoin, but I have no idea what you're talking about. And the person said, okay, I'm just going to forward this to my ISP and I'm going to get back to you. So a day later, we got the response saying that, yeah, this wasn't really my fault. It turned out, or the ISP found out that there was another computer in the same data center, which did ARP poisoning for the entire range of computers in the data center. And it redirected the traffic of all, of all servers over one server and it targeted Bitcoin websites, uh, which was really interesting because when you talk to ISPs, Often they don't like Tor because you know it consumes a lot of bandwidth, sometimes you get abuse reports, all this annoying stuff. I mean it's useful for society as a whole, but you know, ISPs don't like to deal with it. <coughs> and in this particular case, we actually saw a Tor relay that improved the security of the data center because apparently the ISP was not competent enough to monitor the ARP tables of all the servers, right? And only our scans were able to actually show that this was going on. <coughs> Okay, so the conclusion from this could be that, you know, running a Tor relay could actually increase your security in whatever network you're running it in. So this is at least what I like to sum, up, sum it up. Okay, second anecdote. So this crazy picture uh, you could see at some point when you use the particular exit relay. And it was unusual because you would see that for every HTTP website. It was basically injecting this picture in your, browse, in your uh, website browsing. It didn't work for HTTPS, but this is what you saw for every HTTP website. And uh, you cannot see it very clearly here, but yeah, it's a lot of crazy propaganda, uh, obviously trying to scare users. And what you can see here uh, in the white box is hide your tracks, uh, become invisible now. And this used to be a link which was going to some snake oil anonymity software. So it looked like somebody who's trying to sell anonymity software to people set up a relay, uh, injected this, let's call it advertisement, uh, into the traffic of many users and basically trying to steal our users to go over to yeah what they consider advertisement. So uh, luckily this was really easy to catch. Uh, it only took like, a couple hours to get rid of it, but uh, this is another thing uh, we sometimes tend to see. And yes, another one, which happened approximately a year ago. And this is one of the rare uh, targeted attacks we were seeing. Uh, so approximately a year ago we saw three, four relays, which happened to be in Russia, uh, basically doing HTTPS man in the middle attacks. So maybe they were just trying to steal website credentials. And they were very easy to discover and we blocked them quickly and end of story. And a couple of days later, uh, more relays in Russia showed up and they had the exact same Tor configuration, but on different IP addresses. And they did the same thing again, right? And we found them relatively quickly and we blocked them too and removed them out of the network. And this went on two, three times. It was a little bit like a game of whack-a-mole. So you basically try to hit them and they pop up somewhere else. And this went on and at some point it became more sophisticated. They started to uh, target websites. They didn't do the HTTPS for you know every website there is. They only targeted at least facebook.com for some reason maybe more sites because you know we cannot test every website there is we only tested some and only facebook happens to be targeted uh, which was interesting because that seems to be uh, a way to stay under the radar right so they didn't like to get caught apparently they had a real interest in in breaking these uh, https sessions 
and they started to target websites. But yeah, we found that out and then we started to only check those websites. And it kept going like this and then they also started to sample the connections they would target. Because before they would attack every single connection, right? And all of a sudden they started to attack only every fifth or only tenth connection. So that still gives you maybe some users who might have fallen prey to them. But it became a little bit harder to find them because for every relay, you know, I had to fetch the websites 10, 20 times in order to find them. And at some point it stopped, but this is something which really went on for four, five, six months. And there was always a couple days in between, you know, a new wave of relays, but uh, it was interesting because it's one of the few incidents where we see people who really seem to have an interest in yeah, breaking into uh, HTTPS sessions. Uh, now I want to give you a very quick overview of the future. Uh, so what we're working on now and where we could certainly use help if you guys are interested is a civil attack detector. So you might have read that sometimes uh, some nasty people are setting up a lot of relays in order to influence the Tor network in some way. Uh, the more relays you control, the more, yeah, the more traffic you attract and it also gives you some other benefits maybe. So you could start messing with the distributed hash table which is uh, used to implement hidden services. So every now and then we see Sybil attacks where a bunch of people are setting up a lot of Tor relays. And so far they were really easy to discover because the most recent one in December uh, involved approximately 3,000 relays and, I mean, it's hard to disguise that, right? If you inject 3,000 relays in the network from one hour to the next one, there is probably going to be somebody who notices, and that's what happened. Uh, but now think you have 3,000 relays and you inject one every hour, right? Uh, that's much harder to, to detect. And this is one of the things we're working on. We're trying to cluster similar relays and try to find out if they're run by the same person. And if so, uh, maybe we want to take some other measures, like block them. Uh, we're also interested in adding more exit map modules. So if you have some ideas of things we should scan for or look for in the Tor network, then please tell me and we would be happy to maybe uh, add some modules. And of course, exit map is free software. So if you're interested in how it works or if you want to hack on it, uh, then you're more than welcome to. Uh, and finally, uh, we want to work on better onion services, which is basically the new name for hidden services. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a hidden service uh, basically gives the server anonymity because the Tor browser only gives you as the user anonymity. But if you want to run a, a blog, for example, and you're afraid that your government might shut it down, then one of one of the things you can do is you can run a hidden service, which gives you a server anonymity. And it has some issues. It's a really challenging thing to do, especially given that we're building it to some degree on, on the sand that is our internet infrastructure. Uh, and uh, some smart people are trying to come up with better ways to do that. And Facebook is already running a hidden service. So you're able to basically talk. You could log into Facebook without ever leaving the Tor network, which is really cool. And if they can do it, then others can do it too, right? And as long as you don't leave the Tor network, uh, you have end-to-end -end encryption, which means that nobody is able to tamper with your traffic in any way. So there is no exit relay involved which could do anything to your traffic. It's also not sniffable, right? So uh, it has a bunch of really useful security properties uh, in addition to server anonymity. And we're actively working on that and your help is certainly appreciated too. And uh, this is also a big part of Tor's future. All right, so this ends my part. Uh, we have a break now, I think, for 15 minutes. And if you have any questions, please remember them because we have a Q&A session in after Georg's talk. Uh, thanks a lot.